Hi Church, today in worship I wanted to concentrate on worship of adoration and uh, worship with prophetic acts. In the Bible, in the Gospels, in three of the Gospels, there's a story about a woman who brought her offering to God and how amazing that was because it was actually a prophetic act of worship. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 14 from verse 3. Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they, so they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticise her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. This is an amazing story of a woman who brought something so expensive. She could have just given it to Jesus and it could have been used at his burial. But no, she was doing a prophetic act by pouring it out over him before his, his death. You know, God was using her to anoint Jesus. And uh, she really was God's instrument to bring glory in this situation. Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing. And yet, if we sit and we worship him, it, you know, that gives us an opportunity to minister to God. When we minister to God, God has an opportunity to sit with us and to speak to us. It gives him an opportunity to open our minds to what heaven's doing, to what he's doing, to what he's feeling. And so he touches our lives and something changes in us too. And as we reflect on those things, I just want you to rest in adoration of God. Let's just sit and let's just worship him today.
Have you ever been rejected? I bet you have because it's a pretty common experience for us all. And uh, it hurts, doesn't it? It really does hurt to be rejected. Whether it's that you've just been overlooked for something in the school playground. Maybe it's that you uh, didn't have, you had an unrequited love interest. Maybe you were overlooked for a job promotion. Uh, maybe you've been snubbed by your friends or even ostracized by some family. Uh, rejection really hurts. And it hurts because, you know, I think we, uh, they don't see our worth. We, we feel like they, they don't value us. Maybe they don't see us for who we really are. And, and that really does uh, wound us. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 21 that I want to read out for you now. It's a parable and it goes like this. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Uh, he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants and they beat one, killed another and stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them more than the first time and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come on, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the, this is what Jesus turns to the crowd then says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, the crowd replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And then Jesus uh, spoke to them this scripture. He said, Have you never read in the scriptures that the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. You see, the, the masons, they, they would have looked for these stones that had the right kind of angles, the right kind of beauty, the, the level of strength that could be the centrepiece of the structures they were building, that could hold the whole thing up. Many stones would have been rejected for the favour of the one that they had chosen. Jesus himself experienced rejection after rejection. Even those close to him rejected him. Uh, those religious leaders who should have known better who this parable was about rejected him over and over again despite the evidences, despite his testimony and the testimony of others that he truly was the Son of God. And he was rejected over and over again. And when Jesus hung on the cross, uh, he was utterly rejected. The crowds chanted, crucify him. This innocent man whom Pilate could find no guilt in was rejected by the crowd in favour of a guilty criminal that they wanted released instead. And so they crucified him. And as he sat, well, hung on that cross, hands pierced, sides stabbed, um, just utterly in agony, they continued to reject him, to taunt him and to mock him. Yet in spite of that rejection, Jesus didn't lash out, he didn't use his power to smite them. He spoke the words, Father, forgive them. You see, I reckon in our life we can sometimes be like um, a mason. We're looking for that right thing to to build our life on to to put at the center of our lives and all too often we've overlooked jesus but for each of us who are watching this service no doubt ready to take the communion together uh, we have we've found jesus we've realized that he is the true cornerstone the one on which we should build our lives the very centerpiece of all of life itself and we need to put our trust in him and as we take communion this morning, not only are we remembering Jesus himself, the man who was rejected, the Son of God who was rejected, but who the Father made the cornerstone, the very thing on which the kingdom of God is, the very person on which the kingdom of God is built. We remember that, but it's also a time of us recommitting. That even though at times we've chosen to place our trust in other things, to build our life on other things, that there is no one else on which we can build our life. 
You see, I think it was Peter, just after Pentecost in his message, uh, shared that same exact scripture, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he said these words, that there is no other name on which you can be saved. It is Jesus alone. Because when Jesus took the bread and he broke his body, he broke the bread and he said, this is a symbol of my body that is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup and he turned to his disciples and he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. Take it and drink it in remembrance of me. And as you drink, remember Christ, our cornerstone, and recommit yourselves to pour out all those, uh, to, to rid yourself of all those things that we have sought to build our life on that are not of Christ. And recommit again afresh to build your life on Christ alone because it is only if by him we are saved and only in him that we receive life. And so, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love, your grace, and most of all, that even in the face of rejection, that you just poured out acceptance to all who call on your name. We are just so grateful to be included as co-heirs with you. And we thank you for the great sacrifice that you gave for laying down your life for each and every one of us. May your spirit allow us to lay down all those things which are not of you and just pursue life wholeheartedly. In Jesus Christ, amen. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting, sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called him in a loud voice, Stand up, and the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, These men, men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was a Greek god Zeus, and that Paul was Hermes, since he was a chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town. So the priests of the, the, priest of the temple and the crowd brought balls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they pre prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are m merely human beings, just like you. We have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to living God, who made the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you Come into my home. Just say the word from he where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And I, if I say to my slaves do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go back home because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. So today we are looking at the special gift of healing. 
And I say it's special for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's deeply personal for me. Uh, so I've shared before about the story of my younger brother who was um, born with many, many complications and doctors had told my parents that he would not be a viable human being. And yet, miracle after miracle, healing after healing, uh, God just did amazing things, overcame all sorts of things that we were told were impossible. Uh, and so it's got my heart because I saw what a great blessing it was. And it has my heart because it was one of the catalysts for me choosing to give my life to Christ. How could I turn my back on a God who had done such amazing things? Maybe you've got your own stories. I uh, would love you to share them on Zoom at 10.30 this morning. But uh, it has my heart also because it's at the very heart of the gospel. This was central to Jesus' life and the message that he brought, was it not? Uh, if I were to ask you what drew the crowds to Jesus, I reckon a large percentage of you would say it was these miracles, these healings that he did. And it was because they would bring their lame, they would bring their sick for Jesus to heal. And he himself, when he was in the synagogue and opened the scroll of Isaiah, uh, indicated that this was core to who his life's purpose. When he read out the passage, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favour has come. This is why I am here, Jesus said. And if you consider healing, uh, there's two major purposes to healing uh, in Scripture, and that is the restoration and the revelation. So healing restores that which has been broken, and that is the hope that we have in Christ, that this, he was sent to restore creation. That when he returns, this restoration will find its completion and all things will be good once again. That there won't be any evil, there won't be brokenness in creation any longer. And Jesus also came and in his miracles and the healings that he did, he revealed the Father to us. That God was a good God, that he was a loving God, that he was a God who could overcome these things and wanted to release and free people from them. Um, so the, the, the revelation and the restoration, this healing is central to Jesus' ministry. And we're talking all various forms of healing, the physical, the deep emotional and spiritual, the, the release from addictions, etc., and the, the deliverance from spirits, all that kind of stuff comes under this umbrella of healing. But I want you to think about surfing. I want to use the analogy of surfing to talk through this gift of healing. So bear with me, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but... Uh, it, I find it helpful. Um, and you don't have, if you've never surfed, that's all right. These are, these are probably pretty obvious illustrations to do with the sport of surfing. But when it comes to surfing, you don't generate the power. It's simply you're harnessing the power of the wave. There's nothing you can do to increase the power of the wave. You just harness the power of the wave. Uh, and it's God who heals through his spirit. It is his power. It's his ability to heal and not our own. So even if we possess the gift of healing, uh, it is not our power at work, it is the power of God through us. We are just harnessing that power for the glory of God. And so in the story that was read earlier in Acts 14 about Paul and Barnabas healing that cripple, um, the crowd rightly acknowledged that it was the power of God. Now for them, they were saying it was the power of the gods that they knew and understood. Um, and uh, they rightly acknowledged that this could only be the power of a God. They wrongly acknowledged that those gods were Paul and Barnabas themselves. And did you, did you notice Paul and Barnabas' reaction when they found out when the bulls and the, the wreaths of flowers and etc. were coming to be sacrificed to them? They tore their clothes. That was a, a symbolic kind of way of mourning, of grief, of, of frustration. And say, no, 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 we are just mere human beings. But let us tell you about the one true living God uh, by which these things can take place, these healings uh, come about. Uh, now, you might be thinking, well, you've made this point almost every week in this gifted series, Noel, that it comes from God. That's not our own doing. That not that obvious? <laughs> yes, it is. But uh, it's also crucial that we, we know it deep down and understand as these gifts, we are given these gifts, that it is from God. 
because we don't want to get a big head. It would be easy with the gift of healing to get a big head if we're praying for someone and then, you know, their ear opens up and they, they hear for the first time or uh, they're able to walk again for the first time or they've been sick for years and years and suddenly they feel well again. It would be easy for us to come puff our chest and get a big head. But there's only one head in the body of Christ and that is Christ himself. And all this is done from him and for him. And so it's a good reminder for us, but it's also a good reminder for us also on the flip side that we don't need to have so much pressure, put so much pressure on ourselves. Because if someone is sick, uh, is longing for kind of release from something, healing from something, then there is a bit of pressure. There, there does seem to be so much on the line that we can put a whole lot of pressure on ourselves as we pray for it. But the reality is we just need to position ourselves to be able to catch that wave. We just need to paddle into that wave. And that's the next point is that, yes, there's the power of the wave, but you have to position yourself to catch the wave. And so in surfing, you can't sit in the impact zone because you're just going to get hit on the head by the waves over and over again. You can't paddle too far out because the waves aren't formed well enough for you to paddle onto yet. Uh, you have to find the area of the beach where there's a good form of waves uh, and you have to sit in the right position ready to catch those waves. Powerless Christianity comes about when we don't position ourselves to ride the wave. We don't position ourselves with Christ. So Rich Villadas, a pastor in America, posted this on Instagram this last week. Uh, and I just thought it was so challenging. He said, the sad irony of our day is that we can be deeply committed to being a Christian, but not deep, be deeply formed by Christ. If you look to the example of Jesus, he positioned himself to be deeply formed by the Father. He would often retreat to spend time with God. Um, he, he was so deeply formed by his Father that he said what, father says is what I say. I only do what the father asks me to do. There was this very intimate connection between Jesus and the father. Uh, and if we look at the example of Paul in Acts 14, uh, where he heals the cripple, uh, he's preaching. He's doing something else, but he spies this cripple listening in and he says he saw that he had faith. I don't know how he saw he had faith, whether that man was leaning in, the eyes went over and looked really interested. Um, but what I do know is that Paul had positioned himself to, to see where God was at work. He had the Spirit, he was filled with the Spirit of God, and he would go where God led him. And he could see that God wanted to do something here. So he called him out and told him to stand up and walk. You see, just before Paul and Barnabas were sent out, it was during a time of prayer and fasting that um, they were sent out, that they were commissioned to go and do this. Uh, it was as they were seeking God, they had positioned themselves to hear and respond to what God was doing. Do we really expect to hear from God or to be led by God if we really don't stop and lend him our ear? Do we really expect uh, God to consistently respond to our requests if our responses to him are somewhat lackluster or hesitant? Um, can we expect his power to work through us if we actually don't allow his power to work in us first. I'm confident that if you position yourself with Christ, deeply formed and united with him, you will, you, you will see healing in and through you as you position yourself with him. Posture is also really important in surfing. So once you position yourself, you're paddled onto the wave, you're, the power of the wave has taken you, you're going to have to get into a good posture to ride the wave. You can't be too far back on the board because otherwise the nose will go up and you'll fall off the back of the wave. You can't go too far forward because the nose will dig in and you'll flip over. And you have to keep, you can't have a stiff posture, you have to keep yourself somewhat um, flexible to, to ride the wave as it, as it forms. In the story of the Roman centurion in Matthew 8, that was also read out for us earlier, uh, the centurion uh, comes with a posture, three postures that I think are absolutely crucial in the gift of healing, either to receive that gift uh, or to have the gift to um, pray for other people for healing. And firstly, you know, I have the posture of humility. This was a man of standing, someone who uh, was a proud man, 
and, and wouldn't want to have been seen to be weak. Um, and yet here he comes uh, humble, admitting his needs to someone he believed could help. And sometimes that's what humility, well, that's what humility is. It's admitting our needs and going to someone who might be able to help. How many guys out there have had DIY failures because uh, we've, in pride, said, oh, I can fix that, and then have had to call a tradie anyway? I have. Uh, and much of what I've said in the power and the position points uh, speaks to this idea of having a posture of humility, that it is God's power and we've got to position ourselves alongside him. Uh, the centurion also has the posture of faith. That is what Jesus commends him for. He says, I've not found anyone in all of Israel with this much faith. Because you have believed, it has happened. You see, faith is undeniably part of healing. We have to come in faith believing that God can do it in order for it to happen. Because otherwise, in humility, we won't come. Um, Galatians 3.5 says, So again, I ask you, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you have heard or by your faith? Does the spirit work miracles among you? It is by faith. Now, if that doesn't mean faith will guarantee healing, but it is the forerunner to healing. There must be faith uh, in order for healing to take place. Uh, and the final posture this centurion displays is love. Because who was the person that he wanted healed? It was his servant. It wasn't a daughter or a son or a wife or any of the typical kind of people you go, they've got great love for. It was his servant. He could have just discarded with that servant and got another one. But in love... He actually longs for this servant to be healed. Uh, I want to read a quote from John Piper. I just think it captures this really well. Um, and so he says this, Gifts are not the main thing. Love is the main thing. Using gifts is one way to love. It is a great danger to want signs and wonders because they sound neat or, or merely because you think they would make your faith stronger. That is almost a sure way to spiritual self-centeredness. What we should really want is that Christ be honoured through our self-sacrifice in love for others. The greatest need we have is not for gifts of healings. The greatest need is to care that people are sick. Sick with sin, sick with emotional disorders, uh, sick with physical disease and often a tangled mess of the three. The greatest miracle is that our hearts begin to care more about the lostness and pain of others than about our own personal comfort and leisure plans. When that miracle happens, we might be in a position to experience the lesser gifts of healings. Again, reinforcing, we have to come to all these gifts with a posture of love. Once you're up on the, the wave, you've had your ride, you then have to pursue more waves. You've got to chase the wave, you've got to paddle onto them. In a crowd, you kind of have to fight to get a wave, um, you have to pursue. And there's a story where a lady pursues healing from Jesus. Jesus is in this big crowd. They're all pressing in. The scripture actually say it's crushing Jesus. They're, they're, they're so excited, clamoring to get to Jesus. And this woman who has been bleeding for a good decade um, is just desperate to get Jesus to heal her. And she gets to pushes her way through. She would have been deemed unclean because of the bleeding for 10 years. And this unclean woman is trying to push through this crowd, maybe getting jeers and sneers because she's touching them. She's just desperate to reach out and touch the cloak of Jesus. If I can just touch his tunic, I will be healed. And Jesus, we're told, stops and goes, who just touched me? And the disciples are like, well, Jesus, everyone is touching you says, no, no, who was it? And this lady sheepishly comes and says, it was me. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. She pursued healing despite all the odds against her. Uh, and in John, 1 John 5, 14 to 15, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, well, we know that we have what we asked of him. We need to pursue the healing and persistently. You know, all too often I think uh, in healing we pray for it 
And they go, oh, well, nothing happened. Um, I mustn't be gifted. Uh, I guess I tried. Um, but it's important to be persistent. I mean, what would the Olympics be like if this was the mindset people had? Ah, oh, I tried, but I didn't make it. Um, it wouldn't be entertaining. You wouldn't have these great stories of rising up above the challenges. Uh, I think in this, we need to pursue it confidently, but we also need to pursue it persistently. And I just want to add here too, that sometimes giftedness is not always a long term. So, you know, I could be gifted in healing for a particular moment to, as I pray for someone. But then it's not my long-term gifting. It's not like every time that I pray, there's this kind of special anointing that I, that I have to heal. But God, for a short period, might uh, equip me to heal. Um, so there's this long-term versus short-term giftness. And so I think it is, this is one of the gifts I think we should all pursue. We should all be seeking to find opportunities to pray for people that God may heal them, that they may be restored and that they might have a revelation of the God who loves them and wants them as his child. Uh, so how do you know if you do have this gift? Here's just some quick thoughts. Uh, if you are deeply moved by people's need, maybe you have the gift of healing. If you feel prompted to pray for people regularly as you hear their stories and hear what's going on, even if you're not with them, but you feel prompted to pray for them, then, then maybe you have the gift of healing. Uh, if you've prayed before and you've seen fruit, that people have been healed as you pray, then there's a higher probability you have the gift of healing. If you're excited by how God reveals himself to both his children and, and, and those who are not yet believers, then maybe you have the gift of healing. And if you have a very strong conviction that God can heal anything or anyone, and so you pray with that strong conviction, there's a chance you've got the gift of healing. But I want to finish by answering the question, that is always on everyone's lips when we talk about this gift of healing. Why does God not heal everyone that he's prayed for or prayed over? Now, I'm afraid I don't think there is a clear answer that we will probably be left scratching our heads about why God chose some people to heal them and not others. Um, I think there's potentially things in there to do with our, the faith, uh, there's things in there to do with the timing, um, but I think what is important in that question is to, that we keep asking faithfully and persistently and that we do leave the decision. We have that humility to leave the decision making up to God. We, we can ask with great passion and plead for God's mercy, but ultimately it's his decision. You see, I think one of the truths of this question is that we want to know the answer so that if, I pray, if the answer is going to be no, if I pray for this person but you're going to say no, they're not going to be healed, well, I, I, I just won't pray. Then I, then I don't have a faith. Yeah. We want to know that the answer is going to be yes. So that when I pray, it's yes. But God promises he is. So the passage I read out in 1 John, we can have the confidence that when we ask according to his will, that he hears and we have what we ask. You see, we pray to God for healing because he is sovereign, because he's the one that has the power and the might and can overcome all things. And so then we also need to trust his sovereignty if his response is not necessarily what we had hoped for. But it is such an incredibly special gift to us God's people for our, our own fullness of life, uh, but especially for us to be able to reveal the goodness and the glory of God to the people around us. So who are you going to be praying for this week? Well, thanks for joining us for Online Church today. I hope it was a blessing to you. And don't forget the church doesn't stop. Uh, there's still opportunities to connect with one another and be the church. Uh, we've got 10.30, our Go Deeper Zoom, where this morning we're actually going to worship together. We're going to uh, pray together and we're going to do the usual chit chats. Four o'clock this afternoon, we have Make It With Michelle for our Kingdom Kids families. And uh, we're making Anzac slice today. So I'm looking forward to that delicious treat and connecting with all the families then. And uh, on Wednesday, we have Bible study with Mark T on Zoom. And uh, this week, we start a new book looking at the book of Titus. So if you haven't joined before, uh, this week would be a great week to start because over the next couple of weeks, we're going to dive into that book and see what God might have to say to us. Uh, we're also going to have a, a trivia night not too far away. So uh, stay tuned for details for that. We'd love you to come 
and have round two of trivia. Uh, we, we promise the questions will be easier this time. But uh, I want to just encourage you to keep walking, to keep talking with one another, and more importantly, to do both of those with Jesus. Um, we sometimes forget that. Uh, just this morning, I was getting my slow cooked pork ready, put in the slow cooker. And the recipe you know, told me to put it on medium heat and was telling me to do a number of things particularly slow. But in my rush, my hurry to do things as I wanted to do them, uh, I just I quickly turned the heat up and I made it quicker. And so much of that is what we do with Jesus, isn't it? We, uh, in our hurry, in our busyness, we miss the chance, the, the kind of call from Jesus to slow down, to walk with him, to talk with him and let him shape our lives. So can I encourage you, even in the midst of this lockdown and all that's happening, to take the opportunities in this great creation that we have to stop, slow down, and let Jesus shape your life. God bless you all.